So in three minutes we are going to begin, but uh, I would like to say good morning to some people and good afternoon to others and good evening to other people because we have had entries from many parts of the world that are in different times at the moment, even three in the morning. So welcome you all. Uh, I hope you enjoy like I'm sure we will. So introducing Miss Penny Goland from the Remington Ethics. Hello, Penny. <laughs> hi, hi, Anna. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and joining us uh, this evening. Um, it's very humbling how many people are interested and uh, have, have taken the time to log in. And I hope uh, in this terrible time that everybody's staying nice and safe and well and managing to um, avoid the COVID virus. And if, if they do get it, that you'll, you manage to make a good recovery. Um, it's such a strange time for everybody. So, yeah. so yeah, I've been um, reading and showing golden retrievers for 37 years now, and um, I don't know if everybody knows my background, but um, our original golden retriever came from a combination of working and show lines. So she was um, part Lindy's and part hallway breeding. And um, it was a very interesting thing, um, you know, 40 years ago, people probably, there was still um, much more harmony with, between the working and the show side. Um, we had some problems with our first few goldens, so after showing for a little while, we bought um, an, another dog in a, a bitch just to restart, and we started um, with a style bitch. Uh, we restarted with a style bitch and a Wesley dog, and um, obviously from, from there we, we bred down from our style bitch and we've, we've been very successful as a show kennel and we've managed to uh, produce many very successful animals and not only that they've gone on and been successful themselves you know they've produced top brood bitches and stud dogs that have been influential around the world which has been a wonderful thing to get involved with. Um, the wonderful thing about starting in those days is is that we we had an awful lot of support from some you know very famous breeders who um they were very interesting characters they were very strong um and very opinionated and very tenacious and not not frightened of telling you exactly what uh what they thought about things so uh having people like hazel hinks and muriel hathaway and joan gill um, you know, sort of putting you on, on the path. I think, um, you know, it was a very useful um, time of my life and very, very interesting. Over about the last 10 years, we haven't been as involved with the show world because we've had, um, you know, family problems and things, but we still, I'm still judging and um, we still show a little bit. So it's it's good to keep an eye on what's going on and hopefully... Uh, we'll be out there soon. So, welcome today. Okay. Sorry, Penny, I had my sound disconnected. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. So, when you, you, when you want, you may begin. Okay. So, um, as, I, as I was introducing myself already, we, I, one of the things that I have noticed um, is over the last sort of 10, 20 years, the show scene has changed an awful lot. Um, and instead of there being quite a strong association with the working side, we, we almost have now got a, a sort of a generation of, of, of pure show people. And with that, the, the kind of talents that they bring are very different um, and their ability to, to really show off a dog and present it has quite changed what I see in the show world. So uh, my talk today, shall I try and share my screen now, Anna? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to talk to you about... Um, it's, it's a section of a book that at the moment I'm currently writing, which is about the art and science of judging the golden retriever in the um, 21st century. So I'm going to focus on um, 
let me just see if I can move that yeah on how to assess the golden retriever in the show stance um, with the dog in profile and these are it's very important to have um, a really sound idea of what elements make a breed specific silhouette and you need to really take what I'm going to tell you today not just as, a, as an academic exercise you need to start to to look at these elements learn and take this further you, you can only learn it by looking at live moving breathing you know animated animals so this is sort of a little bit of a theoretical um, exercise if you like so I'm going to refer to the breed standard, but I, I am actually going to assume that you all know the breed standard. Um, and as I refer to it, you're going to see where I feel that there are some um, elements that, that could be quantified that aren't. So you might well agree or disagree with me, but if nothing, I hope to initiate some thoughts and some debate. So, um, there's some interesting quotes along the way as well that I've come across and Tom Horner who uh, many of you may well know about he was a very well-known English judge and journalist said that the stamp breed standards are like the Lord Prayer every child can memorize the prayer <coughs> but it takes a lifetime to completely understand it on top of the breed standard you also need to know what the function of the breed is as this gives you additional clues as how the dog should be constructive and move so if you think of it first as the dog having a fit for purpose the standard then gives the detail and the dressing on top of that and it's almost the aesthetics if you like on top of the soundness of the dog Mrs. Stonex, who also was one of the doings of our breed, she said that the whole aim of the standard is the production of golden retrievers who would be suitable for their work of retrieving dead or wounded game, hard days under all sorts of conditions, so that the capabilities for sound and endurance are absolutely necessary. So whether you're breeding, competing or attending working events we all need to be able to make a, a judgments about our dogs how you deal with those judgments might differ very differently depending on what aspect you're coming from when you're judging you need to make a full assessment of the dog and judge to reward their virtues you need to accept faults and failings and reward type and soundness all the best dogs have faults and failings and if you use that in part of the judging process you'll end up rewarding mediocrity and likely untypical dogs so the opposite might be said if you when you choose animals for breeding you may pay a lot more attention to faults or failings because that is where you might be wanting to improve but actually with judging I do use faults and failings sometimes but very very much further down if I've got two very outstanding dogs then I might bring that in but I, I wouldn't do in the selection of the dogs I'm looking for virtues and typicalness first so as we've already said the golden retriever it was bred to work in the shooting field all day it's an athlete it's bred to go out pick up shot game carry it back to its owner without damaging it deliver it to hand and work in all sorts of adverse weather conditions and and all sorts of difficult terrains if i can just say here that the most important thing to a dog's ability to work is actually his temperament and personality and i've seen very many dogs that aren't necessarily structured to a great advantage to be able to do the work but they will work because they have that really deep biddability and the desire to work and the desire to please which is also a really important part of the breed standard and again often an aspect of the golden that's totally overlooked but to me it's their biggest asset so temperament and personality really really play very um, highly on this but I'm not going to talk about it today 
when I stand back in the ring and I'm looking at, at the profile of a dog, I only ask myself three questions. But the first question, does it have type, is going to take probably the next hour to discuss. Then the next two questions I ask myself is, is it age appropriate? And the third thing is, is, is does it have appropriate impression of its gender? So why is the profile so important? Really, it's the sum of all the individual parts of the dog. It instantly presents the type of the dog. It tells you straight away if the dog is right or wrong. And it gives you a taste that the rest of the confirmation and movement will be correct. So Richard Buchamp wrote a, has written a very good book called um, Understanding the Mysteries of Breed Type. And I would really recommend it. I've put some references at the end of the, the, the talk so you can take down some notes if you want. Everything you need to know about the breed is included within the outline. Every breed has its own distinctive set of curves and angles that creates its unique and correct silhouette. The other thing, another um, really outstanding bull terrier person called um, Oppenheimer, he outlined his six key qualities of a judge and important to this presentation is element number five. And he must have um, the flair that recognizes quality and type. So um, what is type you're probably asking yourself and here we've got the the six retriever breeds all of which look very different um, but they all have the same ability to to perform the same function and in many ways if you we thought about writing the standard in a different way we could have written the standard around what this group would function as and the elements that may be needed for um, a dog to be able to um, work as a retrieving breed. So type is the characteristic qualities um, that distinguish a breed. And it's, uh, again, quoting Tom Horner, he says type is the sum of those points that make a dog look like his own breed and no other. So it is really important because um, I'll discuss later on why it is important that we're looking for type and not thing. You need to develop this, this real good blueprint in your mind of what a golden retriever should be. And you need to preserve that image. Otherwise, when you judge, it's easy to be led astray by flash and over-exaggeration or concentrate on an individual point and reward that and not on the type and soundness, which is really the essence of the breed. So does it type, is, does it look like a golden retriever? You know, if it doesn't look like a golden retriever, it doesn't matter how good the dog is in confirmation. If it doesn't have type, it's not a good golden retriever. And you need to really work on this to, to develop an eye so that you can see it straight away. So one of the first things that obviously you can see with our breeders is, is that we have a wonderful coat. We've got a beautiful array of color through from cream to a rich gold. Um, the coat is, is normally, um, you don't see many incorrect colors. You do occasionally see a sort of a mushroomy brownie cream dog, um, but most of the time, um, you know, you, you get that lovely array of cream to a rich gold. And, um, the, there is a, a big tendency nowadays for people to trim in shapes into their dogs and things. When I first started, the trimming was much, much less. Um, you don't want too much coat. It's a hindrance to a working dog. It's a hindrance to a pet owner. They would really struggle to manage the, the, the dog on the left of the screen. He's got a really excessive coat. A working dog that would get trapped in all the twigs and undergrowth. He probably, if he was running around an awful lot, he would get much too hot too quickly. And it's not typical to have that much. You can have incorrect texture when you gain. You can see that when you're looking at the dog in profile, they look fluffy like the central dog. And you sometimes very occasionally get a woolly texture as the dog on the right hand side. The coat is a double coat. It should have a nice thick undercoat. If it's too 
thick and woolly though when the dog gets wet it will stay wet and you want just enough undercoat for the top coat which are the guard hairs to be able to clear the moisture and, and stop the, it from penetrating deep into the coat and I always feel that um, there is a slight texture to the golden coat but actually when you feel it it feels like sort of human hair with a bit of a silicone conditioner on it if you know what I mean um, and it really is a, a, an amazing thing when you see a good coat. So the next thing um, is to consider what the standard says about the outline. So the general appearance is symmetrical, balanced, active, powerful, level mover and sound. And I think really a lot of these elements go together. It's a very short sentence, but it means so much. What does symmetrical mean? It means lots of different things when you look in the dictionary and it's quite an interesting thing to look up but I've picked out a couple of quotes here which is the quality of having parts that match each other especially in a way that is attractive or simile of shape two halves which are exactly the same except that one half is the mirror image to the other the other thing that you could think of with a dog in symmetrical is more or less the same with respect to the sagittal plane and the sagittal plane is the plane that comes down the middle of the animal so down the middle of the head the middle of the backbone dividing the left and right be symmetrical in that way but um hopefully you know you, you're looking at, at relatively um, it, correct from left to right and the, how we tend to use the word symmetrical when we're referring to the dog is that the forehand angulation is in harmony with the rear hand angulation and that the angulation of the fore, the shoulder to the upper arm and the pelvis to the femur is, is roughly the same. So balanced, active, powerful, level mover. Um, balance is the condition of something which is it where which its weight is equally divided that so it can be under control whilst moving now in in a dog the um there is slightly more weight held in the front half of the dog the the forehand carries about 60 percent of the, the body's weight and the center of gravity is usually just behind the point of the shoulder in the mid thoracic line there so the other part of balance is that all the parts of it works together and no part is emphasized too much. So we've got some omissions in the standard that I've already um, touched on. Um, it doesn't define the proportions or shape of the dog. Some standards do. So if you look at um, some of the other gun dog breeds, you might find things like height at the withers should be approximately be the same as the length from the set on of the the point of the chest to the set on of the tail or the body is a little longer than it is high so read other standards because it's very interesting to see how different people have articulated what they feel they want from a dog interestingly the american kennel club um, standard is slightly different from the uk standard and they do quantify the uh, proportions they say that um, the length from the breastbone to the point of buttocks is slightly greater than the height at the withers with a ratio of 12 to 11. So they're actually describing a nearly square looking dog. The other thing that it doesn't define is the proportions of the body parts, i.e. the length of the leg in relation to the depth of the rib cage the length of the rib cage in relation to the depth of the, the loin, the length of the loin. So you, you need to consider what the original purpose of the golden retriever was, and that is as an endurance dog, who is a trotting dog. That's our natural gait for, for a golden retriever. Many of you who have read about the breed will know about Mrs. Charlesworth. She was a quite formidable lady. 
she was actually very responsible for the original standard. Um, and it's quite interesting when you read her book because quite a few things come out and you wonder why didn't they put these things in the standard. So she said here, the build of all gun dogs runs on much the same line as it does of a hunter and a foxhound. They should be built for pace, endurance, and in the case of all hunters and retrievers to carry weight and to jump with it. Hence the necessity for muscular necks so the golden can carry and jump with a nine pound hair when the occasion arises. And I can always remember Hazel saying they needed to be able to clear a five bar gate with a pheasant in their mouth, which is actually no mean feat. For long bladed, clean cut shoulders, sound big bone and good feet. And above all, for short coupled backs, strong loins, muscular quarters and second thighs and straight strong hocks without which there can be no propelling or jumping power and the picture here on on the right of the screen is actually Norambri campfire which was one of her first dogs now this is one of the sort of anomalies isn't it she's talking here about big bone and do you ever think when you see the campfire that Mrs. Charlesworth could ever imagine <coughs> where we are now with bone and substance and things. She did have some things that she talked about balance in her book. She said it's a dog is correctly balanced when he measures the same from the nose to the occiput as he does from the occiput to the withers and twice as much from the withers to the root of the tail as from the nose to the occiput. The length of the tail should be in proportion to the size of the dog and should reach a little below the hocks when hanging down. So she, she was quantifying this when she wrote her book, but she didn't include these kind of things in the standard. If you do watch certain judges, you can still watch them doing these measurements. People like Julia Isles Hebert, quite often you can see her placing her hands in exactly these ways to measure these things. I think in my opinion, I, I rather train my eye to see them, um, but there is sometimes a bit of a difference between what you see and what you feel. So um, Curtis Brown, everybody should read this. Again, I've referenced it at the end. He talks a lot about types of dogs and the, the, how to make an animal fit for function. So if a dog is to trot with endurance, it must have a correct body shape, body size and leg proportions. The length of leg below the chest is as long or a little longer than the depth of the chest. Do remember though with a golden retriever, we are when you are training your eye, you have to allow for the coat as well. The length of the body from the fore chest to the buttocks is longer at the high, at the point of buttocks by the withers by 10 to 20 percent. And when I've done, I've done some diagrams later on, I, I've, I've taken the length as being 15 percent. So you could work a little bit shorter or a little bit longer than this. He said the height of the hock joint is not more than a fifth of the height of the withers, which is fine because we're asking for a nice uh, well let down hock so that the rear paston joint paston is, is fairly short, nice and strong and driving. And the, the shoulder blade should be laid back about 28 degrees off the vertical. Now always do be careful when people talk about um, how they're measuring things because there are lots of different ways of measuring dogs. So um, this, is, this is looking at a, a, the layback from the vertical measurement and not as some people would talk about as, as from the horizontal plane. One of the things that I think has led us down um, the wrong path in the show world is the removal of the weight from our standard. Um, this was done in 1986 and my, my friend Sue tells me um, without any doubt that it was removed because there was a worry that people would starve their dogs to maintain a desired weight. But I actually think that removing the weight from the standard has just opened the floods to say, well, breed bigger and bigger and, and 
more and more. Um, so previously, the 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 weight standard was um, around um, thirty kilograms for a dog and around twenty six kilograms for a bitch. But I've honestly frequently owned dogs that weighed forty kilograms and bitches that weighed thirty five kilograms. Now, some of that could be the fact that we tend to show obese dogs that we have excessive bone, excessive side of size of body and one of the things that adds weight because it adds volume is adding length to the dog um, so we do need to think about that when you look at the the dog here who was michael of morton um, who was a very famous early golden retriever he he truly does look like an athlete um, this is a um, and I haven't altered the proportions of any of the um, diagrams that I, I've made. These are tracings of, um, of actual real dogs. And this is a dog that has won fairly well. Um, but personally, I feel that, that this looks athletic, whereas the other dog looks more like um, a power dog to me. So what silhouette is correct? If goldens are to perform the job that they were bred for, they need they are need to be athletic. They need to be able to have stamina and not to have features that make them um, that hinder them, that make them tire quickly. There's definitely a ratio when you look at athletes about the, the size of their body and their cardiorespiratory um, capabilities. So if your body is too big for your heart and lungs, you will become very breathless. And if you've ever walked at a brisk place with somebody who's overweight, you'll know that they do get breathless much quicker than you do. Um, if you're not overweight, maybe you are, I am. <laughs> so, um, so you need to have the correct sort of um, organ body ratio and, um, and, and the physique that makes the economical use of its muscles. Now, I just pulled off the internet a few silhouettes and all of these are pertaining to be golden retrievers. And which is correct? I don't know if you've thought yourself which one you would like. That maybe looks a little bit more on the flat coat lines to me. I think I probably prefer that um, out of all of them. So we've got to be very careful what we're doing in our breeding. It took 40 years, just over 40 years, to alter the Cocker Spaniel in America to breed the American Cocker Spaniel. And again, it took 45 years, and this is a bull terrier skull, to breed in the downward face of the bull terrier. And both of these happened intentionally because people were selecting for these features. So it's very important that we start to correctly select and not just be led down by certain elements. So one of the things that I look at that people rarely talk about is the head in proportion to the body. This head's slightly small for the size of the body, whereas this head, even though the dog is a very big dog, the head is much too big for the body. So most um, characteristics are inherited genetically. And the information comes from both parents. This is a very interesting study that was actually done on Portuguese water dogs. The um, researchers identified that there were two subtypes of Portuguese water dogs. One that appeared to be um, speedy and they had long skulls, um, longer pelvis, less bone. Um, whereas the other side were the strength dogs and they had shorter skulls, shorter and wider pelvis and much more bone, much thicker bone. Now, you probably need different kinds of Portuguese water dogs. Uh, they're not a breed that I've judged or, or know an awful lot about. Within Golden Retrievers, you definitely do need to have subtypes because when you were working your dog, 
you could be working over different terrains and there would be distinct advantages, say if you were running dogs over heather, um, for them to have a longer leg. I don't know if you've ever tried walking over heather, but it's very, very difficult. And having a longer leg would, would give you a distinct advantage if a dog needs to, to run long distances over, over flatter terrain, then a length of leg again is advantageous. Whereas if you're going to be running your golden retriever in a very hilly and woody area, it would be much more advantageous to have a shorter dog, lower, a, a lower dog and a shorter back dog where you get much more agility. So start now to, to, to look at our silhouette. And one of the things that we, that, that if we start kind of from the front of the dog, because we've already talked about the size of the head in relation to the body, um, the next thing that we're looking at is, is the, the, the top line and the neck. We want a good neck, a good strong neck, because it needs to be lifting. Um, the head needs to be well set on. And when you do have a good neck, you quite often get this lovely crest on the back of the neck that you can see on the top line here. Now, the neck needs to have a, a good reach, but it only needs enough reach to be able to lean forward to pick game up without bending. So, excess length probably makes the leverage effect of the, the, the neck incorrect. So you don't want a massively long neck, but it needs to be in proportion to the body. And that's what Mrs. Charlesworth was talking about when she talked about the length from the nose to the occiput being the same as from the occiput to the withers. Now this is the area called the withers. And this uh, is made up of um, some of the backbone and a lot of muscle. So the fore part of the dog is held um, secure to the body by muscle. And also here where you have, might have very good length of shoulder, um, sometimes that slightly um, stands proud of the withers. So you get this nice angulation angle here on, on the where the withers come down. Sometimes you can see that there are faults where, where dogs don't have an apparent curve on their withers and that's wrong. Then the next section of the dog is, is the top line is his back here where we, we've already talked about a little bit about having a nice short back onto the croup and then the tail set onto the back there. Um, one of the just to, we talk a lot about top line don't we most of the time we're talking about nice level top line nice level back um it can also be quite useful to look at the underline of the dog as well um just because a go a golden shouldn't have a big tuck up but there should be just a nice um rise um under the loin because that needs to be nice and deep and strong one of the things when you're honing your eye in, it can be very useful to look at the space underneath the dog and see the different shapes that you get there. Now, it might be a little bit surprising to you that I've not turned around and said the first thing I look at is the size of the dog. And I don't actually look at the height as I'm standing back looking at the silhouette because things in the background can alter the appearance of how big the dog looks or how small the dog looks. So if you've got a small handler, the dog can look bigger. If you have a big handler, the dog can look smaller. There are things that can alter perspection in the background. And also when you're looking down the line of dogs in the show ring, um, because there will be bigger and smaller dogs, that can alter the perception of how big a dog is. One of the things I would say is that one of the, the factors that, that make a dog look big optically is if it's long. And it's quite a strange phenomenon that because it, it's, it's big in length, not in height, but it, 
if you look, you can really study and you can really see the different effects of, of, of what can affect the appearance of how big a dog is. So I have a, a, a kind of a, a rough mark on my leg. I actually know when I put my hand down towards my knee, what how where the um you know the 22 24 inches are and this is why you need a nice big strong neck is for retrieving game now so um the shorter body it definitely has an advantage um in the single suspension gallop in the canter in the trotting and also in running uphill um also because the shorter back um, allows better attachment of muscles there's a there's less energy needed to um for the dog to lift his four quarters now why are we going the wrong way so mrs charlesworth even 50 60 years ago was saying that the most prevalent faults are long backs these faults are particularly confined to the show bench lounger so um we should be really thinking about that and it's obvious that the dog with these defects can't stand up to a hard season's work and that was mrs charlesworth talking there so we we get given the height um in the standard but we don't given get given any lengths and um i've here had had a look and Basically, if a dog's 56 centimetres high, it should be around 64 centimetres long. The interesting exercise for you to go home, maybe, and measure some of your dogs and see what kind of proportions you come up with. So um, I managed to find quite a nice little picture of a skeleton and of a dog, and this is about 10% longer than it is high at the withers. So from the point of the shoulder, to the point of the buttock that's the, the the length that we're measuring on here and from the height of the withers to the paston you do need to remember that there's quite a lot of um, connective tissue fat um, skin and coat that will make the dog then look longer and that's why i've kept this skeleton at a 10 percent ratio um, and as I said before, if you think about the space underneath the dog, you can start to see some patterns occurring. So um, the depth of body in relation to the length of leg isn't defined well in the standard. And I personally believe it should be roughly a one to one ratio. So 50% of the dog's depth of chest should be should be its depth of its its chest and then the other 50 percent should be the length of its leg and the body should come the brisket should come to the elbow and then the length of the visible leg is probably less because of the coat so what's the advantage of a good length of leg well basically um if you think of, of the legs swinging forward, the longer the leg is, the longer the stride. So if your leg comes out to this point, you've got that length of stride. Whereas if you've got a shorter leg, your length of stride will be much shorter. So it's, it's the single feature of the front construction that gives length to the stride and it gives a good reach of the stride with little effort. Sorry, we keep on going backwards. So if you're looking just at swing from the, from the, the, the leg itself, both the paston and the, the, the swing from the elbow can give you quite a good reach. Now that isn't to say that you don't get reach from the shoulder and upper arm you can um, but what when you start to move the shoulder and upper arm to add length to the reach it requires greater muscular activity and therefore it'll have higher energy re requirements um, so what in a sort of a nice sort of relaxed trotting gait 
you want the length to be coming from the stride and not from the shoulder movement and upper arm. That should be at a minimum, really. Um, and if you look here, there are, uh, the, again, there are two. Um, this is actually from the Jenna study, and you can see she's, this bitch here is she's not move, moving her shoulder and upper arm too much, whereas this dog here has really brought his upper arm forward to add to the length of reach. I find him quite untypical. He's got miles too much coat, um, and there's an awful lot of effort going into this very flashy forehand movement. So is a long forward stride and advantageous to movement? Um, a lot of people consider that the length of the forward stride where, where the foot falls onto the ground should be in length with the, the sort of the drop of the nose, but actually um, it shouldn't be. It should probably fall, the, the front foot should fall somewhere between the ear and the eye. Um, as the body moves forward, the forward swing, the leg comes forward and gravity um, draws down on the body. And the forward leg helps to support the body. And it, it acts as a strut and that strut absorbs the impact of the foot hitting the ground and um, that that impact actually helps to charge the muscles and ligaments then to as the dog moves through the the um, the, the, the stance part of the the, the contact um, then it can push off so it is um, really important that the forehand is constructed correctly and moves correctly. So that forehand, one of the most important parts of it is actually the feet and the pastons because they have all these lovely little shock absorbers in the, in the, in the tiny little bones that help to, to start to act as this strut. Now you don't want a very abrupt upright paston you want a nice, correct, tight foot. The dog walks on his fingertips. Um, so these feet need to be nice and well sprung with, a, with, a, with about 20 degrees angle on the pastern here. And this helps to really act as part of this, this shock absorbing strut. So as the forefoot falls, it's important that, that the foot hits the ground at the right angle so that it, it absorbs the impact through these angles in the, the foot, the pastons, the elbow and the shoulder. When you get a very flashy dog with a short leg that uses its um, a lot of swing from the shoulder and upper arm. Uh, when its foot hits the ground, it's at the wrong angle. And that impact pushes up, causes, causes a pounding effect. Now, obviously, unless the dog's running through water, you can't see the extent of that pounding, but it puts abnormal pressure upwards in, in the, in, through the bone in the, an incorrect way. So I want the right forward reach so that when the foot hits the ground, it, it absorbs the impact, acts as a strut, and enables the dog to, to move forward. So the forequarter is quite a complicated assembly and it holds approximately 60% of the weight of the dog. When you look at the feet, the feet at the front are bigger than the feet at the back and they're there to give this extra um, supportiveness to the, to the increased weight at the front of the dog. Um, when standing, the center of gravity sits behind the point of the shoulder and this point of gravity can actually move and it's usually moved with the, with the dog moving his weight from his head and neck and the, the shoulder rotating backwards. Um, and that's really important 
when you are working a dog because if they can't move the center of gravity particularly when they're going up and down hill then they'll fall over one of the things i'd like to say that i've seen over the last few years is, is a great obsession with four chest there's no advantage of having a prominent fore chest. It doesn't add any lung volume or anything to it. It alters the set of the forehand of the dog and it places the dog, the leg further back under the body, but it also lengthens the forehand of the dog. So the whole set of the front end is, is incorrect for the breed. It doesn't improve function. It's not a requirement of either the breed standard or, or any feature that I've managed to find out to make it more fit for purpose. In humans, we see this as being a, a chest deformity. You might well have heard of the term of pigeon chest. And we definitely do not want a settery type chest in, in a golden retriever. And I feel that this obsession with the fore chest is actually um, not typical and it's altering the shape of the golden retriever. So why do we focus so much on the skeleton? The bones are actually nothing on their own. They're just, they would all just hang out as a big pile like this. So you need um, connective tissue, joint capsules, tendons, joints, um, capsules and, and ligaments and muscles to hold them all together. And the reason that we're so obsessed with where the bones of the dogs is, is that it gives us a clue of where the uh, muscles will be attached to those bones. The bones all have little grooves and, and, and notches and things where the ligaments attach. And um, together, the musculoskeletal system um, is what enables the dog to move what absorbs impact, what creates impetus, and on its own, bones are, are really nothing, but they do give us a clue of the muscular structure. So just moving on now to the hindquarters, um, they're asking for loins and legs strong and muscular, good second thighs, which are the, the, um, the lower thighs, well-bent stifle and hocks let, well let down. Don't forget that the dog is moving in four wheel drive and the hind quarters, they need to be in symmetry with the forehand. If they're not, then you'll start to get movement faults like overreaching, crabbing, high stepping to try and compensate for that. So <clears throat> this is um, how I would hopefully see um, the hindquarters of the dog and if you look at the point of the buttock and look down they sh that should give you a vertical line just about touching the the toes of the dog that enables the femur and the tibia and fibia um, enough space to be um, equally balanced and then to give you that nice round turn of stifle and the the, the, you, will, you get a certain amount of movement from the pelvis in the trot and these are the arcs that can be caused by the, um, the, these various joints that make up the right hindquarters. And again, the foot and the rear pastons are complicated joints that um, help to, to absorb the, the impact of, of when the dog puts his foot down and then to drive off from behind and again I think it's really important that these that the front end and the back end match each other in depth I think that's an important part of symmetry um, and that helps you to anchor this back end in what we're finding is more and more overreach long long um, long bones that, that cause the hop to come too far back and that actually makes the hindquarters weak not strong. The other thing that you can see and I'm sorry for giving you the pictures of, um, uh, of bull terriers here but it's actually quite difficult to, to see this on a, on a coated breed. Um, to have a good strong rear end the quarters must be set correctly and there are two um, different 
issues with set of legs here, set of rear legs. So if you look at the feet, they're very slightly turning out on the dog on the left. And that actually causes the, the hocks to come in tighter than they should be, uh, maybe a little bit cow hocked, and then the knee is turning out. Um, it's well worth looking for this because you can you can see it in profile on a dog um, And it does affect their their efficiency on on the move this other bull terrier here um, His toes are actually turning in his hocks are out and his knees are turning in So you do see, often see that in golden retrievers now just as I was saying about this absolute obsession for um, breeding more and more angulation. Um, uh, medical sciences is, is advancing and imagery is moved so fast over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and there are, there are a lot of ecologists and scientists out there doing some very interesting studies into dogs. And this was a fascinating study that I came across because they actually measured the, um, you, know, you know, when you sit a, an athlete on a treadmill or on a bicycle and they have a, a plug in their mouth and they're measuring the oxygen um, and the expired gases to tell you how efficiently your muscles are working, um, looking at, at both the oxygen uptake and, the, and the, the gases that are expired. They did this with dogs and they actually found that... Um, that the structure of the dog A and B provide, pro produced a much more um, energy effective conformation than um, having a higher um, angulation here. And they found that the, the the cost of transport for the dog, so the nutritional and cardiorespiratory side of it, was, was significantly lower if the angulation onto the rear quarters was lower. So I do wonder if we have been totally kidding ourselves when we say that we want these very over-angulated rear ends because it, it's now being proven by medical science that it's not creating effect efficiency in movement. So selective breeding, it's altered the aerobic locomotion and energy of dogs with the northern breeds retaining an econo economical physiological foundation that um, originated with the gray wolf that would need to trot for days on end sometimes when hunting. So I think we started with a problematic concept. When the Kennel Club um, set up, their original objective was to develop and improve breeds. It was set up at a time of great scientific interest in morphology and biology. And although little was known at the time of genetics, they, did re they were starting to understand about evolution. So when do you recognize that you've arrived at the point of perfection? And how far do you go on and on um, uh, trying to, to um, enhance points? So this outline is a dog who has done very well, but to me doesn't have the shape, um, you know, a typical shape of a golden retriever and is very exaggerated and very over angulated. So I do think that maybe the original foundation set up a mindset that more is better. So I'm just going to quickly knit back to um, our skeleton here that I, I, I've checked all the proportions. The depth of the body is, is in proportion to the length of the foreleg. It's 10% longer than it is higher. And I just happened to be playing around and I plonked it on a picture of Camaro's cave as Christopher. And if you look, that was a bit of a kinching moment because it just absolutely fitted. You know, the dog's in proportion, in balance. I haven't altered that in any way. So I did that with the other dog that we, the, the, the picture that I showed previously where I was 
saying that I felt that it was over angulated and incorrect in front. Interestingly, his feet just fitted in the right place, but absolutely nothing else did. And to, to get the skeleton to fit into that, I had to really deform it, um, drag him forwards, um, make these both this, the angulation and his length of leg in relation to the depth of body and everything is just wrong. Now, this is doubly wrong because where you alter the bony structure, you also alter this, the conformation of how the muscles go. And by creating that kind of angulation in the front, you're going to be lengthening some muscles but shortening other muscles. And that will alter the dynamics and the, the lever actions of the joints. So we have to say now that exaggerated conformation does not enhance function. And in fact, it may be very uh, to the detriment of the dog. So just a little exercise for you. There are three dogs here, none of who are perfect. Um, but how would you place them if you were judging them in the show ring? Who would you put first, second and third? Give you a minute just to have a little think about that. Now to me, an absolutely a no brainer. I put the bitch in the top right hand corner first. She's not very angulated, but she's very balanced. She's very in proportion. She has a very typical silhouette. And actually she has a huge amount of quality in her head. Even I haven't touched on head type and quality, but she is very beautiful. She, she has the correct depth of body in relation to her length of leg. Nice feet, nice little angulation on the pastern and the correct length of, of body. Um, I then put this dog second. I like his type an awful lot. He's not symmetrical because he's obviously lacking a little in forehand angulation, but his general proportions and things are, are correct. Um, and I put him third because I believe that he lacks type completely. So at the beginning, if you remember, I said, I would consider three things. And the second thing was judging to age. I think if you're judging puppies and things, you, you shouldn't be rewarding them for being mature. Goldens are, it should be a slow maturing breed. They go through some very distinct phases of their life. They change and mature and gradually come together. In years gone by, people didn't expect to win with their dog until they were about five or six years of age. And they went on and we showed them, you know, right up to 10 or 11 or 12. Um, it does take time. The coat takes time to develop. Um, but very heavy, mature, finished youngsters don't last. They peak too early and they become too heavy and too cumbersome. And as an adult, they lack the athleticity that's required of a gun dog. I'd also make allowances for the aging dog. You know, you might see more stiffness in joint movement, um, graying of the coat. You know, sometimes the coat texture goes a little as they get older. So the other thing is, is that I want a dog to look like a dog and a bitch to look like a bitch. And that goes without saying. So we need just a couple of little things to say that, you know, you can have this flashy, never put a, put, put a foot wrong kind of dog. Uh, you know, they don't excel in breed type. You know, you've certainly seen a mongrel trotting down the street, you know, head held high, you know, level top line, tail wagging happily, you know. Um, type is so very important and, you know, without, that is the essence of judging. Um, you're not actually, re you're not judging or breeding pedigree dogs. 
and Rosalind Williams, you know, she talked many years ago about the generic show dog. She said they always have long necks, deep upper arms, sloping top line, overangulated quarter, and busy movement, and the more coat and furnishings, the better. This is really worth thinking about because I think this, this is happening more and more in this day and age. You get this very flashy dog, which by showmanship, disguises his bad points, or I would say his lack of breed type. The flat catcher is a dog that looks good, but isn't. And I've seen many of these dogs get their title simply through follow my leader judging. And this is, uh, backs up this um, thing about type, you know, a judge faced with two Irish terriers, one was oversized, slightly coarse, lap body, with slack all over, although moving straight and sound and was not too well presented or handled. The other dog looked a picture. He was small, with excellent confirmation, a good mover, and clearly hours had been spent on his presentation. The oversized dog was placed first, for he was a typical Irish terrier. And although not a particularly good one, with a racy outline and the masculinity one looks for in a male of this breed, the other was too small, too bobby, a pretty dog, but way out of Irish terrier type. And for the judge was right not to put that dog up, and it would have been wrong to have put it up over a, a typical dog. So as a judge, you have a big obligation to the breed. You know, no breed, and I love this um, quote from Oppenheimer. He says, no breed can long continue to progress if it's constantly badly judged, because sooner or later, a general air <coughs> of confusion will grow so that neither the experienced dog breeder nor the novice knows what to do next. And it is therefore of great importance that everybody connected with shows should understand clearly what the term a good judge implies. If the wrong animals are put up constantly, they are liable to be chosen for breeding, which is likely to have a harmful effect on the breed concerned. So it's very important that a high level of judging be maintained. And unless this happens, the general standards of the dogs will almost certainly deteriorate. So I would like to say that I think that um, it, it is important that, that judges learn and put up the right dogs. But it's also very difficult because as a judge, you can only judge what's been put in front of you. So um, do think about that. But... Um, Thank you so much for listening. I hope I've not rattled on too much. I seem to have gone on and on and on. But this, on this page, there's just a few um, useful resources. And if you haven't already read these books, I would camera. really um, recommend that you do. So, okay, Anna. Uh, hello. Hi. <laughs> it was lovely. Thank you. <laughs> so, so now we are going to, um, uh, to connect the, the chat. Yeah. So that people can write you questions. Uh, maybe we can give five minutes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now it's the time. If you have any doubts or would like to ask Penny any, anything, uh, so you can write them down and Penny can read them and answer directly to you all. Okay.
Penny, if you uh, wish to answer as long as people are writing, you don't need to, to wait. Okay, that's fine. So um, there was a question about the head. Sorry, I've, um, blah, blah, blah. Where did we get? From Sue, Sue, um, Sue MP. Um, she, you ask about the head, Sue. Um, I hadn't included that in, in the discussion about the profile um, because the head of the golden retriever is, is, is really very special. And um, it, it, the head is one of the factors that really does um, define the breed and, and is so important. So um, you say here about the length of the muzzle in relation to the skull. So the, the length of the muzzle should be roughly um, the same length as the length of the skull. And um, the, the, um, the muzzle, it needs to be, um, you know, quite broad as well as quite deep. Now, what you don't want is you want, don't want big flues on the muzzle because obviously they've got to pick up gain. So, um, but you don't, so a, a relatively tight fitting lip um, for it. Now it doesn't say it in the standard, but one of the very important things is when you get a good stop, you are, if you look at the head of the dog, that it, it tends to have parallel planes between the skull and the muzzle. Um, you do get a different expression if you have divergent planes. You get a slight down, downward face, which alters the expression of the dog. So um, the head itself, it should be cleanly cut. And it, it's an odd thing to describe because the, the, the skull of the golden retriever isn't flat and it shouldn't be domed either. If you look at a really good skull, it's slightly narrower at the front over the eyes, going wider back towards where the ears are set on. And it's almost half, three sides of a thropony bit, if you like. So the chiseling effect on the skull um, gives a very special shape. Now, obviously I haven't, I haven't um, prepared any pictures for you to have a look at. The other thing is, is the chiseling of the, of the um, head is very important. They include a series of little triangles that go over the bony, um, underlay of the of this the skull and those create a little raised and and indentated areas and it's all very important that a golden retriever has kind of flat cheeks so it falls away underneath the eye the other thing that you don't want is you don't want a very big um, developed muscle on the jaw because obviously you want the dog to have a soft mouth so, um, so the head is very special. Um, it does need um, quite a lot of studying to kind of understand it. Um, and I hope that answers your, your question. Um, you know, things like the eye shape and things isn't really defined in our breed standard. And the shape of the eye, um, you have to really learn that shape because it's neither round nor almond. It's somewhere in between. Muriel Hathaway used to say that a golden has the um, the eyes of a clown. So, um, you know, it is interesting. So, uh, yeah, that, as I say, the, the, the head does need a very detailed explanation. So, um, Sue Brown um, was asking about head carriage. So a high, high head carriage is often praised at, at shows and it's in the field, um, this can be unbalanced in terms of energy use. What would you consider the ideal head carriage? Now, you're, you're absolutely right, Sue. Um, when people watch dogs going round in the ring, in the show ring, you know that they, they, a lot of goldens do hold their head very high. And um, when you go and watch a dog in the shooting field, um, it would only hold its head high when it was spotting. So um, trying to look where the game fell. And um, when a dog runs forward working, it's nearly always held level with its body. 
So personally, I don't wouldn't reward a dog in the show ring just because it was um, holding its head up high. I, I think that pushes the weight back as well, which is against um, sort of more natural movement, if you like. So um, I hope uh, that answers your question, Sue. And actually, if you look at that last piece of research that I, that I showed, they actually did say that they felt that, that a, le a head held level to the line of the back helped with um, creating efficient movement. And you can imagine that would really open up the trachea and, and enable um, the air to get in and out of the body well, you know. Plus, when a dog's moving around, it's using its nose and scenting. Um, so, you know, that, um, that, that would be helpful as well, yeah. So, um, I wanted to ask you, so this is from Gloria, is uh, if fit for purpose is more important than the right proportions? Just asking if type, age and impression of gender are there. Isn't that more? Um, I, I think um, if you, you need to look at the right proportions of the dog because if it's not it, it doesn't work as economically if it's not in the right proportion. I don't quite understand your question, Gloria. Maybe try and reword it. Very quick. Hi, Bruno from Brazil. Oh yeah, so Karen French. Hi Karen. Um, Breed Watch refers to the short leg long body of some golden scene in the ring. Do you think this could be rectified quickly through breeding or would it take several generations? Um, well Karen, that's a, 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 it's taken a few generations to get to change the shape of the dog and um, I think what you need to be doing is, is breeding to correctness. So um, it probably would take a couple of generations to, um, to, to sort the problem out. And um, the, the, the several factors that alter that, the proportions of the dog. So I do think it would take several generations to sort, yeah. So I'm translating a question through a friend, how? Oh yeah, uh, the, the axis of the, the head and the face should be parallel or divergent. I personally think that because we're asking for a well-defined stop, that the axis um, from the, the foreface to the skull should be in parallel planes. If you, if you really study the head of the golden retriever and you look at lots of different goldens, that's when you get the best expressions and also where you get the more, most defined stop. Um, there, are, there are different ways of the, the skull joining the um, muzzle. So you can sometimes get a ski slope effect where um, there's, there's quite a good depth of stop, but it's not well defined. But the parallel planes definitely help to create a much better harmony between the skull and the muzzle. Yeah. Oh, okay, Jose.
Um, so really, um, the difference between the American and the gold and the European Goldens. The Americans actually have a different standard from us. They developed the Golden Retriever in a slightly different way. They did um, more hound outcrossing to improve um, tracking and scent, scent ability. Um, so I think quite often with the American Goldens, you actually see um, you see that in the head where you quite often get a down, downward facing muzzle and a, a longer houndy ear. Um, they, every country is entitled to obviously hold its own standard and dogs have um, developed in, in different ways, if you like, in different countries. So, um, the, I mean, there are, as, as we all know, some very distinct differences between the American uh, and European um, dogs. And I actually believe that a good European dog has, has got a lot more balance than, than the American ones where you, you quite often do tend to get a um, quite a, a pronounced deep chest. We are seeing different outlets in the future, not, not just between the American and the um, European, but within the European um, dogs ourselves. Okay, and Gloria, um, I don't, obviously because of the origins of our breed, the working ability is, is very, very important. It's the re whole reason that the Golden Retriever exists today. Um, there is no one point though that is more important than, than any other point. The, the, the whole essence of what I was trying to say is, is if you have correct confirmation, you have a, a much more um, enduring and um, dog that's able to, to, to have the endurance that you need for a working dog. Now, obviously, most of our show dogs are not going to be required to, to be in the field all day. Um, the, and I think that one of the things that's causing the breed the biggest problem is the split between the show and the working dogs. When I first started and people were working their show dogs, um, they tended to be truer to type than a lot of the dogs that we're seeing today. Um, and I think that there needs to be some kind of harmony between the working and the show people because we do look like two distinct types. Now, when you look at other breeds like flat coats, there isn't that such a division between the, the working and the show type. I do think that the show people don't pay enough attention to what their dogs look like when they are breeding them and they tend to breed for their working ability rather than their, their, um, rather than their aesthetic look. Um, but there needs to be a bit more balance between what we're doing. Okay. It does look like two types. It looks like two completely different types. And actually, um, I think we've probably both gone off on our own track too far and we need to come back and meet somewhere in the middle. So, Silvano, what's your opinion regarding congenital heart problems? Um, the, the congenital heart problems, um, congenital means present at birth. So, um, any animal that is developing um, in utero can fail to um, develop properly. And within the heart, there are some shunts so that when you're, when you're a baby inside the uterus, your, your, your lungs don't work because you're living in fluid. And um, when you're born, 
you the body goes through quite a traumatic process when the lungs open up then over the next course of the next couple of days the shunts that were working with you when you were a baby in uterus will close but sometimes they don't and then you can be left with a, a you know a hole in the heart um there are a, a lots and lots of very complicated congenital um cardiac conditions some of which are do have a hereditary basis and some of which don't now the the one um heart problem that does seem to be hereditary in golden retrievers is is a condition called subaortic stenosis which is um uh, usually formed by um a hereditary hypertrophic cardiac myopathy and that is genetic and and that is inherited and that's a far more worrying um, condition than having a congenital heart disease where you know the embryo is just not quite formed properly um, so um, but we do need to be careful about about hereditary cardiac conditions yeah a well let down hock so the hock is actually the joint where the um, at the top of the rear pastern, and well let down basically means that it that it's near the ground. So what you don't want is a long rear pastern, but people tend to refer to the the, the rear pastern as the rear hock, but the hock is actually the the joint um at the top of the pastern so really you just want the hock near the ground if you like and i think um was it brown said it's about the about the fifth of the length um for an endurance dog a fifth, a fifth of it, the length of its body i can't i can't remember but you just don't want it long in the hock because the the uh, long in the rear pastern Oh yeah, okay. So um, the standard says hot, well let down. How right, so what's the functional idea of it? So um, to understand the function of the, of the rear end of the dog, you have to understand that, there is, that the rear joints are a series of levers that create drive. And to get that really good drive from that, from the rear foot, you're, you're looking at movement from the, 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 the pelvis, the femur, the tibia and fibula, and the rear pastern. And that creates a really strong driving movement. Um, You, you really I need to probably show you um, I don't know if I can sh reshare the screen to show you the um, let me just go
this is the um this is the link to the youtube um um thing this is the youtube thing is about how the muscle groups move it's well worth having a little look at uh, one thing i would say is is that it is probably a german shepherd um as the as the um Sorry. There you go. So it probably is a German Shepherd because it overreaches at the back, but it's very much about how the muscles work together. And um, you can see how the muscle groups actually draw the limbs forward from there. So. So Lindsay Wedge, um, do you feel we are moving in the right direction in the UK for the Goldens? Um, unfortunately not. Um, I think that we're moving away from type and I think that the quality that I'm generally seeing um, isn't as good as in the past maybe. Um, And I do think that we are breeding um, dogs that are too heavy overall. You know, their bodies are far too big for the length of their legs and things. Martha, yeah, you're welcome. Exactly what is meant. I don't like the split in our breed. Not sure what that means, Gloria. Um, Melanie, um, no, I don't think I would do um, a, a, a combination of a working and a show line again. Um, I think that I didn't do that combination in the first place, but I, I don't think I know enough about the working lines to actually to, to be able to do that. Um, I have thought sometimes about using, um, you know, sperm. You know, the way that that, that people used Christopher's sperm in the in the nineties, um, and I do wonder if even dogs from you know 20 or 30 years ago whether they whether the type has changed so much that actually whether or not you would get the type that would would be competitive in the ring today um i would use a working dog if i if i knew enough about their pedigree and they were going to bring me something to a combination that i wanted um but but I, other than that it, it it would have to be very considered Yeah, Joke, I absolutely agree with you that um, that golden type has changed so very much. And I do think that you can have um, a lot of problems with the stifle, both from being under-angulated and over-angulated. Under-angulated dogs, I think, have probably more problems with um, cruciates. And um, you're, you're putting an awful lot of strain on the... On the um, knee joint by having the hock too far back and it, it's creating a lot of pressure within the joints that's that's abnormal <laughs> yeah mick <laughs> yeah why do you think why do you think people like swan necks going on forever we can clearly wrong of being rewarded so much again it's a point of over exaggeration isn't it and people forgetting what the original function of the dog is um i'd say you know we're seeing a lot of dogs with 
with um, very incorrect confirmation being rewarded. And that was one of the things that I was trying to say is, is that judges have a huge responsibility when they take on judging appointments. In my opinion, um, when you judge, the only obligation that you have is to be a good friend of the breed and to judge the dogs for the breed and not for politics or your friends or anything else and um, I've seen some terrible what I consider a terrible examples of judging um, at really at quite top level and I don't understand it so that's my answer to you Mick anyway it's quite hard reading these things out and answering them isn't it much easier to chat about them. Thank you, Penny. It was, <laughs> it was really lovely uh, hearing you, and uh, I thank you so much for doing this. It's Every, all right. Everyone has been uh, writing, thanking you uh, for, for having the time to do this presentation and for teaching us, because there's so much knowledge that you can share that we cannot find anywhere else. Yeah, I think um, in a way it would it would almost make it a little bit better if it was a bit more interactive. Do, do you know what I mean? Um, I, I found I found it a little bit hard to keep the momentum of of what I was trying to talk about um, without having people, you know, sort of talking to me and asking questions and things. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's because of this new law of uh, data protection. We have to... Yeah. yeah. So, someone uh, asked if this is going to be available and we hope so. That's why we disconnected the video so that we can share. So after Penny sees this again and uh, gives her okay, we will place this and send the link to everyone that has been watching, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, Penny, we have the, the president of the group is the Golden Retriever and he wants to say a few words to thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Hello, hello. His name is Francisco Salvador Janeiro. Hello. Hello, it was amazing. It lovely, lovely, Penny. I <laughs> love you. Lovely. Really, really, it was amazing. I'd like to, to thank you for the kindness of sharing your knowledge with us on our webinar. It was excellent, very interesting and stimulating. Oh. And uh, of course, also to Anne and Ricardo, our many thanks for the excellent dynamic <laughs> to promote this presentation. I know, a we lot of hard work. Thank all of you who likes this breed, all the breeders and judges, for your participation and interest in deepening your knowledge about this breed. Thank you, everybody. And <laughs> again to you, Penny. A big Bye. kiss. Thank you. <laughs> You're most welcome. Thank you very much for asking me to do it, and uh, I very enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you, Penny. Thank you thank to you the Penny Retriever again. Club of Portugal. Yeah, and thank oh. you to everyone, especially oh, yeah. to you, Penny. <laughs> okay, Anna, and to you and Rodrigue. You take care. Bye. 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 <laughs>